Hello, welcome to Stories from Strathmore with me, Jimmy Black. No musical instrument has the same power to insult, enrage and inspire as the pipes. Callum Strachan, the piper of Baghdad, used his pipes to insult the Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein, enrage the British ambassador and inspire the 300 expatriates at his back and millions watching on their televisions around the world. This week and next, I'll be talking to Callum about the months he spent in Kuwait, hidden from the Iraqi invaders. Callum learned his piping in the 6th Perthshire Cooperanga Scout Pipe Band, under the tuition of ex-provost Len Apedale. He lives in Ayleth now with his wife Bet and their two children, but in 1991 he was a construction engineer in Kuwait. I asked him if he had any idea that Saddam was about to attack. Prior to the invasion, in the newspaper there were reports of Iraq uh, amassing troops and uh, forces on the border, uh, the talks between the Iraqis and Kuwaitis in, in Riyadh, etc. We never believed for one minute that an invasion would take place. So, really, it was quite unexpected? Very, very unexpected, as far as we were concerned. Although I learned afterwards that it wasn't unexpected from the diplomats. They had, obviously, a lot more information to go on than we did, and they had known for some time that an, an, an invasion was very uh, likely. Did um, the Kuwaiti people expect it to happen? No. No, not in their wildest dreams. In the early days of the invasion, Callum and his friends had no immediate reason to be concerned about their own safety, though Callum himself was far from pleased. He had been due to fly out and leave on the night it all happened. But then things took a less welcome turn. After the invasion, it was probably about a week or so when it became very obvious that we weren't getting out and that we were going to have to stay put and it was becoming very obvious that there was no uh, planned exodus for us. I think it was about 12 days later when we were asked by the Foreign Office to report to one of the hotels in Kuwait to give ourselves up to the Iraqis. We, that is myself and four other uh, friends who were living uh, in a basement at the time, decided to try and make a make our escape across the desert. A few lucky people had managed to get through. We were very unfortunate. We got within about 10 kilometers of the Saudi border and were caught by a patrol of Iraqis. They took one of our vehicles and fortunately sent us packing and we were actually able to get back into hiding uh, without having to give ourselves up. Why didn't you trust the authorities and go along to the hotel? We just had no faith in the British Foreign Office. Was it because they had given you bad information? A lot of bad information. Uh, from day one, they told us to stay put, everything would be sorted out, we would be uh, leaving in an organised convoy under uh, diplomatic uh, immunity, etc. None of it transpired. They told us that the borders were completely closed from day one, when in fact the borders were open for three whole days, with no massive queues, no hold-ups, and expatriates were able to leave the country quite freely during those first three days. So you could have got out? I could have got out with an awful lot of our possessions, which we had to leave behind and uh, see stolen by the Iraqis. Callum's decision to stay in hiding may well have been wise, given that those expatriates who fell into Saddam's hands came to be used as his human shield against Western attack. Meantime, Callum and his friends found refuge in the basement of a block of flats in Kuwait City. I wondered why the Iraqis didn't spot the basement was there. It, would, it was obvious that there was a basement, but uh, fortunately the, the pump for the swimming pool was running continuously, and uh, the Sudanese uh, doctor and his brother, who were basically hiding us, told the Iraqis that it was just the uh, the sewage pumps. So they, they had no reason to, to go in and search a, an underground sewer. The Iraqis weren't actually all that competent then? They were very incompetent. Uh, to see the, the soldiers, we occasionally did uh, sneak out into the stairwell for a bit of fresh air, you know, with behind closed doors and you could look through the keyhole and see the Iraqis walking around. Uh, they were a bunch of uh, 
raw recruits, very poorly equipped. Many of them had uh, flip-flops, you know, slip-on sandals. Uh, one would maybe carry a knife, another one would have a, a, a holster gun, another one would have a rifle. There'd be another two or three without any uh, arms. Uh, their uniforms were mismatched. <laughs> they were dirty, torn. They were just a ragged bunch. But even so, they would still have been dangerous had they known you were there. They'd have been very dangerous, and we would have been treated uh, pretty harshly. Sitting in the relative safety of Scotland, it's hard to imagine what it must be like to be stuck in a windowless basement for months in constant fear of discovery, arrest, and perhaps even torture and death. I asked Callum how he coped, and how long he stayed in hiding altogether. Basically, from day, from day one to our release on the 11th of December was 133 days. You counted them all? Every one of them. How did, what was going through your mind when you were down there? The first few weeks, it was basically disbelief to an extent. Uh, you couldn't really believe that this was actually happening to you. After it began to sink in, you and you were listening to more and more reports, it was getting more and more obvious that a, a major confrontation was going to take place. You began to accept or I began to accept that maybe tomorrow, for me, wouldn't come. And as a result, every day that passed, I, you would get up, you would try and do as much as you could. I practiced my chanter very softly uh, for maybe two, three hours a day, uh, read books, we'd cook, make meals for ourselves, and generally try and keep ourselves occupied trying to do a little bit of exercise, which is very difficult in a, a small basement, although we did manage some. Uh, and I think by accepting the possibility of death, you were able to, to cope with the, uh, the release. When we were released, you were able to uh, accept it and just come back and, and forget about uh, the, the past 133 days and just cast it aside as a, as a bad dream. Callum might have found it harder to come to terms with the situation if Bet and the kids had not come home before the invasion. I was grateful that they were back here in, uh, in Scotland. They, uh, they had left uh, at the end of June, at the end of the school, uh, the school term. And uh, as I said earlier, we were, I was due to come home that night. Could you get any messages to them? We were, after a number of weeks, we were able to... Uh, get letters slipped out and uh, various messengers, um, Kuwaitis, Saudis, uh, New Zealanders, Australians, Canadians were uh, taking regular uh, bundles of letters up to uh, the, the embassies in Baghdad and they were getting them smuggled out. Were they able to move more freely then? They were able to move about without any any problems. It was only purely the, the, the British, American, uh, French, German, all those who had sent uh, uh, their uh, forces to the, to the Gulf. Was there any risk for these New Zealanders and so on if they'd been caught taking your letters? There, they would have aut automatically been picked up and arrested and probably shipped off to some of the installations as well. Uh, if Kuwaitis were caught, they were just shot. Well, the Kuwaitis got something of a bad press during the war, but they certainly showed their courage in helping the expatriates right home to their families. Next week we'll hear how Callum and his friends finally made it back, and of how Callum kept on playing the pipes while angry Iraqis threatened him with their guns. That's all from Stories from Strathmore, so from me, Jimmy Black, it's cheerio.